Happy Wednesday. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see all of you here. My name's Suzanne Bryan, and if you're joining me for the first time, um, this is a, a live stream where you get to interact with me. You can ask questions. If you would like to ask a question in the chat, be sure to start your comment with the word question in all caps. That makes it easier for me to find. What we're going to talk about today is the project we've been working on, which is a drop shoulder bottom-up garment knit in pieces and seamed together. So let's see who's on here already. This is always the fun part. Okay, so we've got Catherine and Pamela Matthews, Kelly Mycat, Teresa Brown, and D, Leslie Dunn, Francoise, Karen Pung, Mary Inman, and Kathy Trykowska. Some more people will show up shortly, but we're just starting. So, to catch up on the news, you know, that coronavirus is going around, and so far in the town where I live, we have nine people being tested, but we haven't had any positives yet. The county up from us, about 100 miles away, has one positive, and Los Angeles, which is south of us, has quite a few and they had their first death today. So it's kind of scary, um, but I have a lot of yarn. I have a stash, and this is a good time to focus on my stash. Um, and we can always do things like this live stream so we can still get together and still chat and be safe at the same time. So, First, I'm going to go over some questions that were asked on Ravelry about our current project. And then I'll go over questions that you have over here. And um, let's see. So the last question that was asked last time was from Jilly Lynn. And she had accidentally bound off too early for the modified drop portion of her sleeve. So her armhole was a couple inches too deep. She wants to make it a little higher. And I had suggested picking up stitches along that area and making an extra stitch on the edge that would connect to the body and then seaming the two together. So Fiddlebeads asked, this is a very good question, after I made that suggestion, she said, Why did you recommend that Jilly Lynn use mattress stitch to join those two pieces? rather than join as you go. I would have thought joining as you go would be easier. Is mattress stitch less noticeable? In my opinion, mattress stitch would be invisible, whereas join as you go, depending on you how you do it, makes a thickness right there because you're knitting into the stitch and creating a stitch on top of it. Also, some people, when they join as they go, only join one stitch for every two rows. So in that one column, you would have half as many stitches and it would be noticeable. It, you know, you'd probably have to point it out to somebody for them to see it, but you would know that it's there. Mattress stitch is pretty invisible. I got a bunch of samples out here to share with you. So this is two pieces. Let's see, it's too bright. Let me see what I can do about that. Sorry, that's better. This is two pieces. You can see the seam on the back and I used a contrasting color yarn, but the stitches go perfectly across the front of the fabric. Can you see that? You cannot see the seam. It's, sti it's matched stitch to stitch. That's pretty durable. Even when I pull it apart, now, if I use the same color of yarn, like in this one, I use the same yarn as the base. You can see the seam if you pull it apart, but it's pretty. It makes a, a perfectly smooth fabric across the front and is invisible. And that's why I like to use it. Whereas join as you go is going to give you a ridge right along there. Um, I don't have any samples of join as you go. Um, hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't pull any out that would show that. But that's my personal opinion. And uh, to, in all else fails, swatch first to see if you like it. I can't tell you. I have 
bags and bags of swatches. And I keep them all uh, because I can refer to them later. So this is from Tidy Frog 1, Tide Frog 1, and she says, question, she's making the modified drop shoulder and she has a little cable design going right up the very edge of where the drop shoulder is and she just has one single column of selvage stitches next to it for seaming. She said, should we plan for the selvage edge of the arm opening? Yes, you should. And I think I had that in the directions that you need to maintain a selvage edge along the opening. After arm bind off left with one column of stocking knit, then cable pattern, will there be a proper seam from the sleeve to the selvage of the arm opening? Yes, there will be. So what you're going to be doing at that point is you're going to be seaming stitches to rows. And I don't know if I found that swatch. Duck on it. That's not one of the swatches I pulled out. But I have a video on that. Uh, seaming stitches to rows, which is really, really good. And what you'll end up with it looking like is... Let's see. So here is the front of my sweater. Here's the front over here. This is where the sleeve is attached, right here. And I did leave a line of stockinette. And so I'm at this point, I'm seaming stitches to rows. And I have a video that shows how to do that, to where it comes out absolutely perfect. So that you don't have any puckering. The gauge is matched up. So you need to know the um, for this example of her connecting the sleeve to her, she has her modified drop shoulder and she's going to connect the sleeve in like this. You have rows here, rows. You have stitches here, correct? So when she puts her sleeve into here, this part between my thumb and my little finger, that's going to be stitches seam to rows. And here, this is rows. And these are stitches. You're going to sti seam stitches to rows again. And that's in the new directions that just came out yesterday. I explained that. And I have excellent videos on how to do that. So what you've got to do is you've got to know your row gauge here. How many rows you're getting per inch. On here, this is the stitches of your sleeve. You need to know how many stitches you're getting to the inch. Let's say you're getting five stitches to the inch and seven rows to the inch. That means you need to match up five stitches with seven rows. So how would you do that? You would seam two stitches to two rows, skip a row, seam three stitches to four rows, or to three rows, and then skip a row. So you go two, skip a row, three, skip a row, two, skip a row, three, skip a row. So over here you're using seven rows, over here you're using five stitches. And that will make the two fabrics merge together perfectly so that the fabric is smooth. There's no puckering, there's no pulling in. It looks absolutely perfect. And you'll use that on the modified drop shoulder. You'll also use that on the just plain drop shoulder too. This is from Demetria. She says, how would you join this type of yarn? And she shows a type of yarn that is a uh, chain plied. And you can't really do the chain, you can't really do spit splicing with chain ply. In that case, I would knit to the point where you're going to change yarns, leave a tail that's three or four inches long, start with the new yarn, leaving three or four inches, and later on, weave the ends together on the back side weave these ends this way, weave this in this way, and it will be invisible. You use duplicate stitch on the reverse side of the fabric. That's what I do. And you know, a lot of people say that they'll ask this question, when you're starting a new yarn, not a new color, but a new yarn, let's say you're using white yarn and you need, you're finishing a ball and you're gonna start a new ball of white yarn. I don't change at the edge, especially if I'm gonna be seaming. Because if you change at the edge, that means you're going to be weaving in ends at the edge and it's going to make a bulky seam. I change in the middle of the fabric somewhere. And it really does not show. 
I use the duplicate stitch to weave the ends in on the back side of the fabric. I mimic exactly the tension of the yarn and it looks perfect and you can't really see it. Okay. This is from Danesty. And she says, just a second, I've got to make a little comment. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, Dan, um, Danesty says, I'm still working on the back of my sweater. I was planning a saddle shoulder, so I'd need to bind off early to, to accommodate one half the width of my saddle. But this got me to thinking about the neckline. Wouldn't this mean my neck won't go as high in the neck as it would for a basic drop shoulder? For instance, if my sweater has a three inch saddle, I'd need to bind off one and a half inches sooner, but that would make the back neck of my sweater one and a half inches lower than if I didn't use a saddle. Is there a way to compensate for this? I have a problem with my necklines not coming up high enough in the back as it is. It is a saddle maybe not the ideal construction for my body type. The first thing I would say is three inches is a very wide saddle. I usually recommend like two inches for an adult. That means you would be down one inch in the back and one inch in the front. On mine, this is a drop shoulder. There's my saddle going up to the neck. And my saddle is two inches wide. So if I fold it in half, there's the saddle. And here's my neckline. So what happens in the back? Yes, it does come down a little bit. There's the back. It's going to come down an inch on either side. But this portion is going across your shoulders. I learned something from Lily Chin. This was really, really good a long time ago. Um, she makes a lot of her garments. She does back neck shaping. Have you ever wondered why there's back neck shaping versus no back neck shaping? Back neck shaping fits people everybody's neck is different. Some people, their neck comes forward. Some people, they have a very straight neck. Some people are in between. For people who stand up very straight and their neck comes straight up from their body, back neck shaping allows the sweater to for their neck to come up. If there's no back shaping, the back of the sweater will come up like this around their neck and the front will hang down lower. If your neck comes forward, you don't need back neck shaping. If you have back neck shaping, your garment's going to come down even lower. So I'm pretty straight up and down. A little bit of back neck shaping works good for me. So I'm not going to take this garment off, but it does have a little bit of back neck shaping. But you can see that it's going straight across the back of my shoulders here. The same with this. There's the back neck shaping. So this is one of those times when trying on different garments to see how they fit you is a good idea. Uh, you don't you want to do that before you invest a lot of time in your sweater. Um, go to the store if you don't have garments at home that are of the variety that you want to create, a neckline that you want to create. Go to the store and find something that has back neck shaping versus no back shaping back neck shaping and try it on and see how it fits. Okay. Now that's good for that one. This is from Sewing Marie. These are all really, really good questions this week. These is exactly the kinds of things that I like to talk about. She says, I have a few questions. I have heard people mention that for certain style sweaters, such as raglans and drop shoulder, that it's necessary to reinforce the neck sleeve sections with a crochet slip stitch so the necklines and sleeves don't stretch out. Does binding off tightly as you instruct eliminate this need? What are your thoughts on this subject? That's number one. Number two, would it be possible for you to demonstrate how to sew in or insert the saddle sleeve to the front and back shoulders? That's two. Three, 
What yarns have the tight twists that you mentioned in your instructions? Do you have any yarns you prefer? How would we know that a yarn has a tight twist when purchasing online? That's Those are all really, really good questions. So let's start out with, if you're making a vest that has no sleeves and no weight hanging off of the seam line of the shoulder, the shoulder does not need to be bound off tightly. It can be bound off with regular tension because the garment is just going to weigh, you know, hang from the front and the back of that seam. There's not going to be anything pulling on that seam like a sleeve, okay? But if you are going to have a sleeve, you want to have this, the area between the neck and where the sleeve connects to be tight and non-stretchy. Now in wool and other uh, knit uh, knitting types of fibers, even when you bind off really, really tightly, there will be somewhat of a stretch. And I have several examples here. This sweater, it has set-in sleeves, but the uh, fabric is very lacy. This is that mermaid's mesh lace, okay? This is my garment. It has sleeves. So here is the shoulder, and this is all seam. So here's the shoulder seam. There's the shoulder seam. If I hold it up over here to the light, can you see it there? Where it's coming down? Right here. So if I pull on that, very little stretch. I did not do a crochet a chain on it to reinforce it. I just bound off tightly. And that's what you want. Um, let's see, this sweater, which is the first drop shoulder that I ever did, and I knew nothing about knitting when I knitted this. I made it many, many years ago. Now we need a little more light. Can you see the seam is right here? Can you see that? That's the, the, the saddle. So let's stretch this seam. Oh my. And this sweater does tend to look kind of a little bit sloppy on me because it, it gets really big, but I didn't know about binding off tightly. Then there's this sweater, my current green one. Here's the saddle. Here's the neck right here. Here's where the sleeve joins here. So let's pull on that. That's tight. Okay, that's what you want. Uh, otherwise, when you put this on, the, the weight of the sleeve will literally stretch the shoulder way out. Now, if you've already made the sweater and that you didn't bind off tightly, yes, then you can use a crocheted a reinforcement. That would work great. Do it really, really tight and use some type of fiber like silk or something that has no stretch to it whatsoever. And you should be able to pull it up really tightly. So this is one of the things that, um, for example, when you're knitting a top, should you bind off and seam the shoulder? Should you kitchener the shoulder, not bind off and use live stitches? Well, in some situations, each will work. For example, if it's a vest with no sleeves, yes, you could kitchener the shoulder because there's not gonna be anything pulling on it and it will give you a perfect uh, continuation of your stitches over the top of your shoulder. But if you're going to have a sleeve, don't kitchener. You want to seam the shoulder and you want to do a tight bind off first. Now, that doesn't mean you need to bind off tightly everywhere. And in the new instructions that just came out, I described to you for each of the elements where you're going to be seaming, whether you need to bind off tightly or a normal bind off. For example, the top of the sleeve. Here's where my sleeve joins the body. Can you see that? This is the top of the sleeve right here. You want to bind off that normal. 
you don't want to bind the sleeve off tight because you know what would happen if you bind off the sleeve tight? It's going to pinch up under your arm. So you want this seam to be as stretchy as the fabric that you're creating. So this needs to not have a tight bind off across this seam here. Okay? But the neck, yes, the neck needs a tight bind off. The top of the shoulders need a tight bind off. Now, if you're making a crew neck, <laughs> no tight bind off or you won't be able to get it over your head. If you're making a crew neck, then I advise binding off in pattern and binding off moderately loosely. Try it on a swatch first, okay? So that was her first question. <laughs> Let me go down to the second question. Would it be possible for you to demonstrate how to sew in or insert the saddle sleeve to the front and back shoulders? Um, I don't have a sample ray to show you that, but I do have a video that shows how to seam stitches to rows, and it's the same thing that you'll be doing. Also, in the, the instructions that come, came out yesterday, uh, Andre, um, Francois' husband, Andre, did the most awesome diagrams uh, for me to show which areas are seamed to which areas. I think that you'll really appreciate that. Her third question is, what yarns have tight twists that you mentioned in your instructions? Do you have any yarns you prefer? How would we know what a yarn has a tight twist when purchasing online? Okay, let me get a sample out here. This is some of my new uh, Corona stash, coronavirus stash. Um, this is a yarn I just purchased. This is Anzula. Uh, Anzula is a lady, a company that's in Fresno, just north of me. This particular yarn is called Squishy Fingering Socks. So it's a fingering weight. It's hand dyed. This particular one is 80% merino superwash, 10% cashmere, 10% nylon, and the color is honey. There's 385 yards um, in a skein. It's 100 grams. So when I look at yarns in the store and in person, I do look at the skein, you know, and the color usually calls to me and kind of look at, is there a halo? If there's a halo on the yarn, that tells you right away it's probably not a tight twist. See, there's no halo on this. Can you see how the edge is crisp, smooth, no halo? That's one thing to look for. Another is I actually take a strand of the yarn and I pull it up away from the skein and I look at it. Let me get it up here where you can see it. I look at that strand. And then I take the strand and I untwist it a little bit. And I actually examine it. For example, this is three ply. I want to make sure it's three or more ply if I'm going to be doing cable work with it. Um, two ply, you can do cables with two ply, but they will be flat. They will not be three dimensional. If you have a two ply, the yarns lay together like this. See, they lay right next to each other and they'll be flat. If you have three ply or more, do you see how that looks round? When you get three or more plies together, there's four. Then it makes a round yarn. If you just have two ply, even if it's twisted together, it makes a flat yarn. And if you're making cables, you want to have a lot of dimension, right? So you want to have three ply or more. And it can fool you. Two ply can look like three ply when you're just looking at the yarn, depending on the spin of the individual plies. So I take up one ply. I'm going to get this so you can see it in the back, black background of my shirt. I untwist it and look at the individual plies so that I can tell, you know, how tight is it. Now, if you can't buy the yarn in person and you're looking online, there are other things you could do. One is look at the description of the yarn. Some yarns will tell you how many plies there are. Some won't. Um, if the yarn does not tell you how many plies, you can go to Ravelry and look the yarn up on Ravelry. And if it still doesn't tell you the plies there, you can go to people's projects and look at their projects and look at their comments about the yarn. Uh, I do that a lot. I think, um, to tell you the truth, I don't read any forums on Ravelry except my own forum, but I do use the information about yarn a lot. 
And that's one of the reasons that I put my stash in Ravelry. Because if you put your stash in Ravelry and then you go and you're looking at the yarn, you go, oh, I just love this yarn. What can I make with it? You can look this yarn up on Ravelry and see all the projects that everyone has made with it. And it gives you inspiration. You know, it can get you started on to find the project for that. What I'm going to make with this, let me show you what else I got with it. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but that's okay. So when I realized that it was fruitless to go shopping for toilet paper, I went to the yarn store and I got two skeins of this, which is the honey. Isn't that pretty? I love it. And I got two skeins of this color. This one is cedar. I think it goes with the honey pretty good. Um, and I got two skeins of, this one's called Blanche. Ooh, it's looking good. Um, and I only got one skein of this color because it's all they had. I would have gotten two if they had two. And this is called Vixen. But I have another skein of this already. So um, I have these four colors. I like them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a double knit vest. Um, I'm, I'm designing it. Uh, I have my drawing. And in the process of thinking about, you know, I've been working on this scarf that's by a sock matician. I'll show it to you slowly. I'm like, oh, a third of the way through it. It's, it's slow going, you know, because I have my whole family living at my house. So it's time my time is different but so this is where I am on this chart I'm about halfway through that chart I love this one isn't that pretty that's um, the blue and yellow together turquoise and, and turquoise and orange and then I'll show you the other side so what's fun about this is experimenting with how the colors play together we'll start at the top see this side looks different on this side. The blue and orange, blue and orange, I mean uh, blue and yellow. Even the purple and yellow. And this is the Vixen. This purple is the Vixen. It's uh, this color. It's real dark. So there's the one side. Here's the other side. So you can see whether you like, like some of the colors are subtle together. Some of them are stark. And you can see, I really kind of like this, very subtle, but kind of velvety looking. And you can see what you like about it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at all these different ways that the colors play together and thinking about my vest and choosing the colors that I want to do for my best. So I need, I'm really motivated to get the, I, I'm, I'm making myself finish the scarf before I start the vest, because if I start the vest, then I'm just going to be knitting on the vest. Okay, so did I answer the question about the yarn? I know it's hard with yarn. When I first started knitting intensively, we only had one yarn store in Bakersfield, and she hardly ever got in new yarn. You know, once you went there, you'd seen everything she had, and that was it. And she didn't particularly carry yarns that turned me on. Nothing called to me. You know, I'd go down there over and over, and nothing called to me. Um, the first time I got to go to a yarn conference. Um, I went to Stitches West. Uh, I think it was in 2008. And there were like 300 vendors there. And I was overwhelmed. I actually got stimulation overload. I couldn't make any purchases. I couldn't decide on anything. But I got to touch a lot of yarn. And that was just the beginning. That wasn't enough. I didn't get it after just that first time. It was just too much information. But I went again and again, and over time, you start realizing that there are not very many yarn bases. 
the yarn bases are similar. For example, this one that I was holding up is the Superwash Merino Cashmere and Nylon. It's uh, 80 10 10. You will see that a lot. It's also called um, MCN, Merino Cashmere Nylon. And a lot of different dyers use that same combination. So once you've seen it from one dyer, and then you see that same type of yarn from another dyer, you're going to have a pretty good idea of how the yarn is structured and whether it's going to be a tight twist or not. Um, so it's just, I'm sorry, but it takes time and touching and seeing a lot of yarn or talking to a lot of people getting on Ravelry and talking to people about their experiences with their yarn. Okay, so this is from Dolise. And Dolly says, if I'm knitting a heavily cabled cardigan that will require 14 skeins of kettled dyed yarn, but three of the 14 are much different, how would you approach this issue? How would you deal with this? I'll need at least two of those oddball skeins for the cardigan with one devoted to swatching. Um, I did that one time. You can look on my projects on Ravelry, and there is a dark and stormy sweater that I knit for my daughter. And there were a couple of skeins that were much lighter than the other skeins. It's kind of a purple sweater. Uh, what I did was <clears throat> I used one for swatching. That's a good idea. The other I used for the cuffs um, and the shawl collar. And uh, I had enough of the darker color that I could blend it in for the shawl collar. So I did two rows of the lighter and it does give a little bit of a stripey effect, but it actually looks really good on the shawl collar. If you, or you could start, uh, you know, midway on the sleeve and start blending and you could do um, every third row for a while, then every second row, and then every, every um, like every fourth row, every third row, every other row down till it gets heavier a solid color of that one color for the cuff and then you can use the same for the neck and the button band if it's a very heavy yarn that will probably take up your um, two skeins because they don't go very far in a heavy weight yarn I don't know whether you're talking about a heavy weight yarn or that there's just a lot of cables another thing that you can do is um, Blend it into both sleeves exactly the same. Uh, but I wouldn't put it in the body because you don't have enough to blend the whole body that way. I hope that answers your question, Delise. This is from Lindy Bear. Question, I'm using a superwash wool for my sweater. It really requires a trip in the dryer. When blocking my pieces, should I place them in the dryer and remove them when damp rather than do the wet blocking you described in the tutorial? You can try that. I would try it with a swatch first before I did it with your whole sweater. I do know that superwash wool can get really big and then it's really hard to get it back into shape for blocking. Believe it or not, um, once it is dry, even if it's really big because it got out of all out of shape, eventually over a week or two, it will pull into the size that you knitted it. Now, sometimes what happens instead of that is that you made a gauge swatch and you start knitting your sweater and your gauge got looser and looser and looser as you got relaxed and were working on your sweater. In that case, the sweater is going to just be bigger. There's no fixing that. I highly recommend double checking your gauge as you work. You can't compare it to your blocked swatch, but you can compare it from the beginning of your project. Go back to the beginning, recheck your work in process, and make sure that your stitches are not getting bigger or tighter. Usually they get bigger. I haven't seen uh, anybody personally where their stitches got tighter when they were in a sweater. The thing is when you're knitting the swatch you're concentrating and thinking and you tend to knit a little bit tighter and then once you're in your sweater the stitches loosen up because you're in your zone you know and you're not thinking about it and maybe you're watching TV and you're just knitting along and everything loosens up and then before you know it it's really big. Okay 
But I have never thrown a sweater in the dryer, so I can't really answer that. I always just block them, uh, and I've never really had any issues. If the garment is bigger, I just pat it into place. And, um, and, and it works out. So this is from Lady Vivian. Question, I have done a provisional cast on. I'm planning to do an I-cord bind off later as I'm planning to use a different color of yarn but have not been able to decide which color yet. Could I do the I-cord bind off after I steam, seam the sweater? Yes, that's an excellent idea. You can do it when you're completely done. It'd be really pretty because it's not so easy to seam I-cord. I mean, you can do it, but I think it would look much more continuous and fluid if you put the I-cord on at the very end. Okay, so let me just double check and make sure there's no more questions on Ravelry. Give everybody a chance over there. Okay, I got all those. Now let me look over here and see what you guys have been up to. Okay. I'm just looking through the chat. I'm not reading it. I'm just looking for the word question. Okay, Leslie. She has a question. Let's put it over here where everybody can see it. Um, she says, how do you feel about holding the new yarn with the old yarn and knitting a few stitches with both before dropping off the old yarn? You can do that. It's exactly the same as duplicate stitch, except that you have no control over which yarn is on the front of the fabric. In the process I was talking about, which is duplicate stitches, same process, same end result, but you're duplicate stitching over the backs of the stitches so the duplicate stitches don't show through to the front of the work. They're kind of floating on the back of the work. And the stitches don't look thick. Whereas when you knit with two yarns together for a little while, it does tend to look like thicker stitches because they're both on the front of the fabric equally. Just try it on a swatch. Really, you will be sold. You will be completely sold on weaving in the ends. I love weaving in ends because I know they're going to look really, really good. Uh, used to, before I knew how to weave in ends properly, it was a chore and I hated doing it. I can't say that it's my favorite thing to do, but I do like doing it because I know they're going to look good. Okay, this is from Carol. She says, what type of yarn is good for lace as far as plies and twist? For lace, you can use um, any yarn, but uh, two ply and one ply look especially nice in lace because they make, they're they very flat and when they block out, it makes that it's very smooth, satiny uh, surface on the lace. Looks really good. And always remember, if you want to look lacy, use a much larger needle than your yarn normally would call for. For example, if I'm using fingering weight yarn and I'm knitting a sweater, I might use a four, three or four needle, maybe a five if it's for summer. But if I'm knitting something in lace, I might use a six or seven needle with fingering weight yarn to get a lacy look. That's if you're making lace. Now, some people confuse lace with shawl. Not all shawls are lace. Some shawls are in garter stitch or mosaic knitting or cable knitting and that brings you the topic of blocking shawls. Some people think you stretch all shawls when you block them. You only stretch lace when you block it. You don't stretch garter stitch or mosaic or cables when you're blocking them. You let them be the, the way that they want to be. Um, and then we'll even go a little bit further, some people think that the word blocking means stretching. No. Blocking means getting the fiber wet somehow and laying it in the position that you would like it to be once it's dry and then allowing it to dry. That's blocking. Um, and you can get it wet by immersion you know, put it, dropping it in a bowl of water, pressing it under the water. You can get it wet by steaming but don't touch a hot iron to your fabric. You hold the steam above it or use a fabric steamer. Or you can spritz it, like just use a spray bottle with water and spray the fabric until it's wet and then allow it to dry. So any of, oh, and you can, one other method, you could use a wet towel, you 
put your piece out, put the wet towel on it, and then allow the whole thing to completely dry. In the series that I did, the tutorial that I did on the skill lace skill building tutorial, I teach you every single one of those blocking methods. There's, uh, I think, four or five little um, mini shawls that you make that you learn all the different aspects of knitting uh, lace and shaping lace. So each one I have you block in a different way so you can learn all the different ways of blocking. That was kind of cool, very fun. Okay, does that answer your question, Carol? Now, let's see. I can't wait to start that vest. Oh, my goodness. Dolise said it's Malabrigo Merino worsted, so it's worsted weight yarn. So that that is a good heavy yarn. Um, I think that, the yeah, the two skeins would work good for the uh, button band collar, and if you're doing a shawl collar, for sure, we'll use all that up. And then Kathy Trikowska said, Dolise, I had a similar problem with different shades for a sweater I knit for a friend. I worked the ribbing of the sweater sleeves and the neckline and cables for the sleeves and the skeins. Yeah, you could add the ribbing to it, too. That's a great idea. Thank you for adding that, Kathy. This is from Carol. She said, hi, Suzanne. Let me put her question over here. Question, please explain how to start the modified diagonal pocket. Do I work the pearl bumps first? Knit the lining and then do the cable flare compensation. Many thanks. So, Carol, are you putting a cable in your uh, pocket? Is there a cable? If you're going to have a cable in it, yes, you have to involve cable flare compensation. If you're not having a cable in your pocket, you don't have to do anything about cable flare compensation. Um, I know that it's hard to imagine how that pocket's going to turn out. And I highly suggest, before you start it on your sweater, make a pocket swatch. It, would, it won't take you all that long, but you'll see how the pocket comes together. And there was a mistake in the written directions for the pocket, which is now fixed for that particular pocket. Uh, so be sure to look at the, it's on page 31 in the right-hand column down about four paragraphs up from the bus shaping. I had to change a couple words in there. So you'll see that in the new, um, Direction. Somebody caught that on Ravelry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you do see mistakes or things don't make sense, please let me know because I'll try to correct it. Anyway, Carol, I highly suggest knitting the pocket. Just follow the directions. Make a swatch pocket. You don't have to make it very big. It doesn't have to be full size, but you'll understand how the pocket comes together. And then it'll make perfect sense to you and it's not so complicated. Pat Gordon says or asks, I used a provisional cast on for my sweater. Is it possible to seam the sweater together then add the ribbing in the round? Yes, it is. Yep. That's a grand, grand idea. And why not? It'll look great. It'll look great. Okay. Anne says, I am in T TMHK, the Master Hand Knitting Level 1. Started out using Cascade 220 yard, white yarn, but found it, her question went away, let me add, but found it twists easily and splits. Also, lots of issues with how it performed. Found the natural color seemed better. Um, yes. You know, Cascade 220, they used to get their yarn, it used to be Highland, Peruvian Highland wool. And it was lovely wool. That's the same place where Knit Picks uh, either used to or still does get their yarn. But then Cascade 220 changed to getting their yarn from China. And I'm not saying that Chinese yarn is bad, but they started using a different yarn, a different source for their yarn. And it's not the same as the old. So if you're used to using the old Cascade 220 and then you start using it in, this has happened quite a few years ago. This is not recent news. This happened maybe 10 or more years ago, eight or 10 years ago. Um, you can look it up. It, cha they, it changed the, the, con the fiber content somewhat and it doesn't knit exactly the same. I do like the undyed yarn for the Master Hand Knitting Program. I liked it too. Another yarn that I really liked for the Master Hand Knitting Program, the undyed, is from, let me look it up real quick. I'm going to get on the internet. Hold on. 
Let's see, what is the name of that yarn? It is Hedge, Hedge, something with a hedge in it. You know, when you get older, you don't think very good. Let's see, fiber, hey, it's a, hmm, fiber, hedgehog, fiber, no, it's not hedgehog, stone hedge fiber mill, stone hedge fiber mill, and you can get from them the, uh, the shepherd's wool in the undyed, and you can get it in non-superwash. And I love that yarn. You can use the superwash too, but I think you get better blocking results with the non-superwash. And you know, in the Master Hand Knitting Program, blocking is very, very important. So you might want to try that. So um, Dolise said, when we were talking about her sweater and she's blending the yarn, she said, thank you for helping me work out a plan to blend in the two rogue skeins in a cabled cardigan. Sarah's sweater actually looks more interesting due to the lighter colorway being used. Yeah, I think it came out cool. It, it was a good use of it. This is from Fatima. Hello, Fatima. Could you explain the best way to weave the yarn when change color in a round? Um, yes. I have a video on that. <laughs> um, the one on um, jogless jogs. I have two videos on jogless jogs and they show you how to weave in the color change for knitting in the round so that you minimize the jog. Yeah, just look for that jogless jog. And D, question, can you recommend, and, but that, Fatima, let me tell you quickly what I do is when I, I use duplicate stitch on the inside of the work, you know, and like, let's say you have white and then red and then white, 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 white. You have white, 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 red, red, white, 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 white. Okay, and you need to weave in the ends of the red. I weave in the ends of the red over the red both ways. And I weave in the ends of the white over the white. And that helps minimize the jog. Okay? let's see Andy I think I addressed this she said can you recommend recommend a yarn from the proof lifts for swatches in that is plied opposite from the original twist more balanced I have limited yarn budget um, get to the best yarn for the program I'd have to and can you send me that message uh, publicly on Ravelry or Facebook and I because I'll have to do a little research and I don't have those materials out in front of me right now so um, and I don't even know where they are I'd have to look them up to see from their approved list okay I'm sorry I don't have it ready right here okay Carol so th she says this is in answer to her pocket the front is mostly cable with with no cable on the pocket I love the pocket from the top down and would love to knit the same on this sweater. You can do that. So yes, you would use a cable flare compensation if a little part of the pocket is going to have cables. Usually when I make a pocket, I don't put the design underneath the pocket. Underneath the pocket, which I call the lining, I just do in stockinette stitch. Uh, because if you do your cable patterning and put the cable on t the pocket on top of the cable, it's going to be too thick. And it's, 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 I just don't think that works very good. It's my personal opinion, but you can do it however you want. That's just my personal opinion. So underneath the um, pocket, let me go get, if you can bear with me, I'm going to go get a sweater I knit years and years ago that's not finished. It's been in the corner all these years, and it has the very first version of my pocket on. Let me go get that, okay?
<laughs> this is how I keep my yarn. I have many of these. Okay, I had to bring the whole thing because it's still attached to the balls. Wait till you see this. There's the front. Oh, and it's on Denise Needles. Oh my God. A long time ago. So here's my first pocket. This yarn is from uh, Blue Moon Fiber Arts. So I've got all those cables going, but here's the lining. See the cables stop for the pocket. So the pocket is just, and look at the ribbing on the bottom. I just love this. I got to get it out and finish it. Whoops. Where's the bottom? There's the bottom. So here's a yarn in to weave in. So what I'll do is I'll just duplicate stitch it over this way. It closes that gap. But this was my first iteration of that pocket. And so then the cable is going up the front and here's my buttonholes. So I didn't do, an, I'm not doing a knitted on, I'm doing the button band as it goes. Here's the other side. So here's the whole sweater. Here's the middle of the back. And there's the other pocket on the other side. So, um, this took a lot of knitting and unknitting and trial and error. And here's my sleeve. I did a completely different design on the sleeve. Do you know why? Because I realized this is before I, way before the master hand knitting program, before I knew anything about what I was doing, that the heavy cables that were doing on the body of the sweater were using the yarn up really quickly. And I don't have that much of that yarn. So I switched to a design on the sleeves that doesn't use as much yarn. This yarn is, I think it's divine and it's a single. Actually, it's not a single. It's one of those, one that's made out of about a gazillion itty bitty little plies, but it acts like a single and it's um, bulky. And the, um, Colorway is pond scum, my favorite color. So let's see if there's any more questions over here. That was kind of a tangent, wasn't it? Hedgehog fibers is not the one for the master hand knitting program, although I love their yarn. I do have hedgehog fibers too. But um, the other one that I mentioned, um, whatever it was, I can't, now it's gone, but that, it's a really, really good yarn. Pamela Matthews says, another good yarn for the Master Hand Knitting Program is Nature Spun Worsted by Brown Sheep. Also, Patton's Classic Wool works good too, and it's inexpensive. Um, I've seen gorgeous Master Hand Knitter sweaters knitted with Patton's Classic Wool. It is gorgeous. The knit picks, they're plain worsted, uh, Wool is very good too. Christina Goody says she's from the UK and wants to know if the Master Hand Knitting Program accepts people from the UK. You can be from anywhere in the world. They accept anybody. Oh, Plymouth Galway. Nancy Creedmore says she used Plymouth Galway and she liked that too. Yes. Okay, Fatima. I find very ugly the row junction when I join a new yarn in the round if it is one color per round. I do it in the middle of the needle and not on the beginning of the needle. What do I do wrong? So Fatima, are you talking about using doing like um, um, helix knitting where you're just using two colors and you're switching every row in the round? I'll let you answer. Or do you have more than one color, and they're one one row per one row of color? 
there's a little lag here between when I talk and when you hear me, so it'll take her a second. If you have one row stripes, you can do helix knitting without ever breaking the yarn, and there are no ends to weave in, and they there's no beginning or ending. Um, I have a video on helix knitting, and it's super easy. It's just a matter of how you manage the color change from one yarn to the other. You don't want to twist the yarns. Uh, some people think at the end of the round when you change a color you need to twist the two colors. That does not look good. Don't twist the colors, just make sure they're untwisted and pick up the new color. Oh, I mean to knit a fair aisle with two colors per round. You're right. So if so there that's the thing, okay? Um if you notice a lot in fair aisle sweaters, let me see if mine's in here. Let me go get, let me see if I can put my hands on it real quickly. Sorry. Okay, this one was knitted in the round and it's a cardigan, so there was a steak. And that's when you're talking about a pullover. But if you're doing a pullover, there's not going to be any steak. What you can do is at the sides, at one side or both sides, you make a break in your pattern. Can you see the break under this arm? It's subtle. It's hard to... There we go. It's like a mirror image. Okay, can you see? Can you see this coming down right here? Oops, it's over here. Right here. Can you see that? That's where there's a pattern change. I didn't put a specific line. Some people actually put a line, a solid color line, or two lines or three lines. This is where you can break at the change of the round. So if you're going to have a jog, you would make it right on the edge of this break. And then it's not very noticeable. Whereas if you have a pattern that is continuous across and you're doing a, car, a pullover, so there's nowhere to make a break, and you just make a break, it's going to show all the way up the side of the sweater. So you'll see in many fair owl sweaters, you'll see actually lines, like two or three lines going right down the side of the sweater. And the pattern comes up to meets the lines on this side. And the pattern comes up and meets the lines on this side. That's where the jog can be. And your eye will be fooled by this break. Do you see that? And on the other side, on that break, I put my initials. And the year I used the break, see there, 2014 SB, I put right there, 2014 SB, right under my arm. But here's that break. Can you see it? Right here. Does that answer your question, Fatima? Does that help you? Okay. I think I've covered all the bases today. I'm really excited seeing the sweaters you guys are knitting. They are absolutely fantastic, beautiful. There are no two of the same. Uh, some of you are very, very thinking outside, way outside the box, which warms my heart immensely because that's what this is all about, is pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and finding out that you can do it. And it will open your mind forever after to how you think about knitting. So um, I don't have anybody lined up for the next couple Saturdays for interviews, um, but then I'll start back up again. We had planned a trip to France for the next two weeks, and it's kind of becoming iffy. We haven't canceled yet, but uh, things are 
looking kind of scary. So might be better off to stay home. And in, if that happens, then I'll try to get some people lined up for interviews. But right now I'm going to be on vacation and I don't have anything lined up. I do plan on getting out the last portion of this sweater in the next week or so. Um, the parts, parts that are remaining after you do the seaming are the finishing, putting on the button bands, deciding what kind of neckline, collar, whether you're going to have a shawl collar, whether you're having a cardigan or a pullover and all that kind of stuff. So that'll be coming out real soon. And most of that I already have written up. So it's um, not too much work to do. And I want to really, 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 really thank Francoise and her husband, Andre. They proofread for me. They find my mistakes. Um, Francoise makes wonderful suggestions on my wording. And um, her husband draws all those little diagrams for me that I used to do painstakingly, taking me hours and hours and hours. And they always turned out looking like a children's drawing. And his are so professional looking. And I appreciate that so much. So we'll, I'm going to get off the air. I think that we've answered all the questions. And Fatima says, yes, great process. However, I'm not allowed to change the direction. Oh, oh, or you test knitting or something maybe, huh? I don't know. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Happy knitting and stay safe. Knitting is very safe now. You know, this is a good thing to do. Um, get your stash out. And we'll meet here again next week. So, see you later. Bye-bye.